welcome, Louis. Um, thank you so much for coming in to speak to Legal Choices, um, to speak about immigration and asylum. It's lovely to have you. I don't know if you'd um, like to just speak a little bit about your background and how you got into immigration law. That'd be brilliant. So yes. over to you. Thank you, Benita. Yes, yeah, so um, my name is Louis McWilliam. I'm head of immigration at Truth Legal Solicitors. Yeah. Um, I got into immigration in, I think, 2009. Yeah. So originally my focus was really asylum work in legal aid type work. Yeah. Um, but started off as a paralegal, then progressed to becoming a solicitor later on. Yeah. And I'm currently running a department at Truth Legal. Oh, lovely. Or I assume you tell the truth at Truth Legal. So I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> um, so just if we take it from there, in what sort of situations in asylum and immigration might I end up needing um, or benefiting from legal representation? I would say that there's certain cases, immigration type of cases, where you yeah. really want a legal representation, such yeah. as a solicitor. So something like an asylum case, I'd say pretty much any asylum case is going to be complex. Mm. A deportation or removal case where someone's at risk of being um, removed to their country of origin. Yeah. Or in a human rights case, these are all complex cases where you pretty definitely want a solicitor. Yeah, Even in some of the kind of more straightforward cases, mm. um, immigration cases, it can help just to navigate this quite complex yeah. system of rules that we have in place in the UK. Absolutely. Um, do you find there's any areas where your clients are underprepared, that they come to you for guidance, or where they would engage with a legal advisor? Um, is there anything you wish some of your clients had known before they engage with you? Mm, I suppose it's really important that my clients are telling me kind of full details about their background mm. and their circumstances. So occasionally there might be a situation where the, my client doesn't really know what they're meant to be, what's important to tell me. Yeah. Um, so obviously it is the job of someone like myself to get that information out of them, but yeah. it is important that um, the client divulges their full background because it could be really important for their case. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine some of the details are quite traumatising they've been through, so a lot of empathy, I'm a sure, a needed. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Um, particularly in asylum cases, they're coming from a traumatic background, yeah. difficult things have happened. So, yeah, we try to sort of be warm and uh, empathetic with our clients so they can open up fully. Okay, sounds good. Um, if we could just um, change course a little bit into mm. asylum, is there someone feels that they, um, if someone feels they, that their legal assistance relating to asylum, what options are available to them to find out what's going to happen and accessing advice? Okay. So there is a, I guess one starting point might be the government website. Mm. Okay, so there's fairly basic information on that about the asylum process and mm. what to expect and the, the basic requirements. You might also get in contact with a charity or not-for-profit yeah. specialising in asylum and refugee. Yeah. They can often be a good starting point and put you in contact with other relevant bodies and could even refer you to an immigration solicitor. Yeah. Ultimately, I think you're going to want to get immigration advice from a representative um, and so a charity or not-for-profit can refer you to maybe more experienced ones or yeah. ones with the right kind of... Um, specialisms in your particular type of case. Yeah, so you mentioned charities you can go to. Is there anything mm. that you can name for us that um, consumers would find quite helpful to go sure. to? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I guess a couple of the big ones that have good reputations might be Refugee Action. Yeah. Okay, they tend to have offices in most cities, yeah. or there's a, a really good one in London called Asylum Aid. Oh, cool. And there's the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. Okay. So yeah. all of these would be a pretty good starting point. Yeah, absolutely. Can individuals represent themselves? And when it comes to asylum applications, or is it always a good idea to seek advice from a legal advisor um, when applying for asylum in the UK? So there's no requirement to have a, a lawyer or mm -hmm. a legal representative. But I say, especially in asylum cases, you really do want legal representation. Yeah. And that's because the cases are complex. Mm. There are quite strict procedures. Mm. So, for example, if you miss a deadline, you don't hand in a required piece of uh, form or evidence, then you mm. can kind of come into problems. And also, an immigration advisor is going to really know how to navigate the system. So, it's not mandatory, but I think it's certainly recommended. Yeah, absolutely. What do I need to be aware of when searching for asylum advice online, would you say? Okay, well, I think you've got to kind of search online and, and take what you find with a bit of a pinch of salt. Mm. 
Okay, so there's stuff like the government website gov.uk. You can kind of rely on that for information. Yeah, and then maybe be a little, little bit careful when you're looking on the kind of company websites of different providers because you don't really know yeah. what's out there. You can't be 100% sure mm -hmm. that it's reliable. Some of the information will be helpful. Yeah. Some of it might not. So you just need to be careful and do your research. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes online information can all be a bit overwhelming. So, yeah, uh, yeah, there's a lot. And I, I mean, yeah. you can maybe use that as a starting point, but yeah. I don't think that's a substitute for actual legal representation yeah. and, and having tailored advice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if we just change gears to immigration for family, what things do UK citizens who are wanting to have a family from abroad come and live with them in this country um, need to be aware of if they're thinking about getting legal advice? Okay, so most um, family members who are being brought over to the UK, so a common case would be like a spouse or a partner mm. um, from another country wants to be brought across they'll always need a visa, yeah. okay? And there's different rules around the different types of visas. So there'll be one set of requirements for a spouse, yeah. another one for a child, yeah. another one for a fiance. And there's quite strict rules, um, yeah. eligibility rules to meet for that. So there, yeah. for example, there's a financial requirement for partners and you have to provide exact documents, mm -hmm. bank statements, pay slips, and letter from employer. And if you don't provide one of those documents, they've got a basis to refuse your application. So mm. you do need to be really careful to, yeah. to kind of be ticking off all the boxes. I kind of think of these applications as a giant checklist that you yeah. have to tick off. Yeah, quite Getting them all right, you get a big tick. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, what options for accessing legal advice and information are there in this area for those that are looking to bring over a partner or a family member? Mm -hmm. So there is limited, a bit more limited legal aid in mm -hmm. the kind of family type visas. It's generally not available unless there are so-called exceptional circumstances yeah. and, and you've got a helpful lawyer that can help you to get legal aid. Mm. Um, generally you'd be looking to pay for an immigration lawyer, so an mm -hmm. immigration solicitor or someone who's regulated by the OISC mm. and they should be able to advise you properly on the correct process and legal requirements. Yeah, you mentioned regulated by OISC. So they there are kind of two ways of being regulated, mm. so either regulated by the Solicitor's Regulation Authority or by the OISC, yeah. um, so you have to be regulated by one of the two yeah. in order to give immigration advice. Makes sense, thank you. Um, if we just change gears to immigration for work, is it necessary to have a visa to come and work in the UK? Do you need a legal advisor um, to help you apply for a work visa? So you almost always need a visa mm. of, some, of some type to work in the UK yeah. and most likely in order to work here you'll need to be sponsored by an employer. Yeah. Okay, so that um, employer will need a sponsor license and they can sponsor you mm. and then you can submit your visa application yeah. in order to come here and work for that employer. Yeah. So there are, I mean it's kind of similar to the family visas in the way there are certain requirements to meet. There'll be an English language requirement might be a requirement to have a certain amount of funds mm. and then obviously you need the sponsorship from your employer yeah. and it can help to have an immigration advisor to gu guide you through the process until you've got the visa in your hand. Yeah, and out of interest, how long does that process take then from start to finish? Uh, kind of varies a bit mm -hmm. depending on how busy the Home Office are. Yeah. So the standard processing should be three weeks. Yeah. But, you know, a few years back or recently with coronavirus it's been yeah. more like you know many many months so you have yeah. to kind of keep an eye on the processing times yeah absolutely. at the time you apply okay uh, quite critical if you can start a job so uh, absolutely it can yeah, be it can quite be anxious difficult way. to time that yeah, yeah absolutely um how's the process of applying to come and study in the uk different from the one if you wish to come and work mm. well maybe I, could i start with how they're similar yes yeah, um be... so both with the work visa and the study visa you yeah. need to be sponsored yeah Okay, so that's maybe the starting point, but w with the employer, you're sponsored by an employer. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, with the university, when you're studying, you're sponsored by the university. So that's the uh, main difference is, yeah. is who your sponsor is. Mm. And then there's slightly different requirements in terms of like, there's a higher level of English required if you're a student compared oh, to working. Yeah. Um, oh, that's interesting. Mm. Um, because that's, that wasn't something I was aware of. No, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Um, and is it just universities or is it any um, education provider? Yeah, it can be. It needs to be um, an authorised education provider that has a sponsor licence, but not necessarily universities, although they are probably the most common. 
Is there a place you can go and check if they're a um, formal educator provider? Education? Yeah, there is. A, there's a register mm. of sponsors, so you can look that up online and, and find okay. out who's got a sponsor license. Oh, great. I would imagine all the main universities, yeah. in fact, all the universities will have a sponsor license. How and where do employers need to be involved in applying for a work visa? Do employers also need to access legal advice as part of that process? So, yeah, as I mentioned, the employer or the university, mm. whoever's the sponsor, will need a sponsor license before they can sponsor a worker. Yeah. And that can be quite a tricky process. Mm. Um, the Home Office regards having a sponsor license as this big responsibility, so they place quite a lot of duties on the sponsor license holder. Mm. Um, so it's quite a lot of the work I do is helping these businesses navigate this system, yeah. get a license so they can sponsor people from overseas. Oh great, so it must be quite interesting from the dual part of someone who wants to come out of that and for business and organisations. Yeah absolutely, you know it's interesting working with these businesses and helping them because there's massive shortages and stuff like yeah. hospitality, yeah. chefs and care workers. Yeah. So we're helping quite a lot of those kind of businesses yeah, plug absolutely. gaps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just going through um, your just your experience of working as a legal advisor, what's it like to make an application for asylum with the help of a legal advisor? Well, I mean, I, obviously I can talk about how it should be, mm. perhaps. Um, so I guess the purpose of having a legal advisor is really to be able, like I mentioned before, to guide you through the process. Yeah. It's important that a legal advisor in an asylum case, a case is empathetic, understanding yeah. and yeah. patient because yeah. There's obviously this, there's often this difficult history, difficult yeah. story to, to be relaying. So yeah. I think being patient and empathetic is really important. Yeah, and I can imagine you probably hear some really tough stories out there from yeah, clients coming in. Yeah, some pretty harrowing stories, yeah. yeah, of all sorts, which can be, yeah, can be difficult at times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how will my legal advisors support me if English isn't my first language? Just from my experience, I speak two languages. So it can mm. be quite difficult communicating what you need and want. Um, yeah, so your legal advisor should really be making allowances for any kind of language barrier by yeah. getting a, an interpreter. Yeah. So they should uh, get an interpreter to any sort of important appointment or yeah. telephone meeting. And if you're accessing legal aid, that should be covered by legal aid. So mm. it shouldn't cost you anything extra to get an interpreter if you're already covered by legal aid. Yeah. And then similarly with uh, documents, if you have documents that aren't English, yeah. your lawyer should be able to arrange for them to be translated. Great. Sounds like a great service um, for those that English isn't a first language. Well, it's, yeah, yeah, it's essential. Yeah, yeah it's essential. Um, what, what can you expect from your legal advisor in an immigration or asylum application, including standards, behaviours, Okay, so all immigration advisors have to be regulated, mm. whether that's by the Solicitor's Regulation Authority or the OISC. Yeah. And what that means is they are held to quite high standards. Yeah. So they have certain expectations mm. of them. They have to do regular training, yeah. ensure they're up to speed with the, the knowledge of the law. Mm. Beyond that, there's professional obligations yeah. or a duty of confidentiality. Yeah. And that's um, a key one, given all the... Absolutely essential. Yeah. So obviously the idea is that anything that you tell your solicitor doesn't go any further. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you'd expect your advisor to be kind of have a good level of knowledge as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how, do we, how do you know if your legal advisor in an immigration or asylum application is genuine and not a scammer? Um, so I know you mentioned being regulated. Um, so... Is there any advice you can give? Uh, yeah, so just to kind of maybe expand on what I said before, yeah. you have to be regulated to give immigration advice. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's a criminal offence even to be giving yeah. advice if you're not regulated. Yeah. So you want to be really checking out the credentials mm -hmm. of the person who's claiming to give you advice. Yeah. So you can check that they're regulated. You can check against the, say, the Law Society. Yeah. It has a register of who's a solicitor. Yeah. So absolutely. you could check that side out. Yeah, absolutely. So and there's various places you can look on them, um, whether that's the SRA's website or the OISC. So yeah, absolutely. Right. What's the advantages of using a regulated advisor um, in an immigration case um, to and how to identify regulated um, legal advisors? Mm. So I mentioned before about the kind of standards you're expected yeah. to adhere to if you're, say, in my case, mm. a solicitor. Yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately, there's, if you're not getting the kind of uh, advice that you think is appropriate, there are ways to address that, yeah. um, which there wouldn't be if someone's unregulated. Yeah. There's no real recourse there at all. What are some of the most 
common misconceptions on the part of an asylum or immigration mm -hmm. case? Well, I guess quite quite often a kind of misconception you'll have near the start is where uh, an asylum applicant, for example, will kind of think they've got this very smooth, fluid process that yeah. um, you'll just be able to kind of sail through. Yeah. So really making sure you can set expectations early on is important, because mm. unfortunately the asylum process isn't straightforward. Yeah. You can get through it, but it, it can be a bit of a rocky road. So yeah. really, I suppose you're beholden to processes and time frames. Yeah, you have no control. Yeah, there's no escaping it. Yeah. I guess a kind of common thing you'll hear is that um, a family or friend had a certain experience. Yeah. Um, maybe they got their visa or permission to stay relatively quickly. So my client now might expect that same process. But yeah. it's really getting across that each case is different. And yeah. You can't really compare one case with another. I suppose as a legal advisor, you just have to take it case by case. Um, yeah, basis. Um, there's no one size fits all. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, different yeah. backgrounds mean they're going to be treated differently. And yeah. also at the Home Office, they sometimes they're operating really efficiently. So you'll yeah. get a quick decision. Then sometimes there's these enormous backlogs and yeah. it's really difficult to do. If your asylum or immigration application is unsuccessful, and I'm sure that can be a really devastating experience yeah. for clients. Um, do you have any grounds to complain um, about your legal advisor? Um, what can you do if you think your legal advisor isn't doing a good job? So, I mean, if you've lost your asylum case, you, the question would really be whether your legal advisor has been up to an adequate standard. Yeah. So if they've not been up to an adequate standard, then you can, I guess the first point you might do is complain internally to the organisation. Yeah. Um, and then see if the outcome of that is not satisfactory, then the next step might be to go to the legal ombudsman mm. to um, lodge a formal complaint mm. in respect of the, the behaviour yeah. of the advisor or the, the, the firm that's assisting you. Yeah, and I suppose it's quite key to make clear um, the legal ombudsman, they'll look at service complaints, so if there's been a delay or you've been sp not... Um, responded in a timely fashion etc so they'll look at that service aspect that mm -hmm. you've received um, how can you be sure that your legal advisor and the UK authorities considering your asylum or immigration application can be trusted so well we talked about legal advisors before in terms of they have to be regulated and they're held to certain standards mm -hmm. and there's a complaint system if they're not adhering to those standards in terms of the Home Office, mm -hmm. so they also have really strict rules governing them about how they have to treat an asylum claim. Yeah. They've got very detailed guidance about how to treat a claim, yeah. how to assess a claim. So they should be really working to quite a strict framework as well. They can't yeah. just sort of go off and make random decisions. Mm. Um, and ultimately they are held to account through a complaints process as well. So you can yeah. lodge a complaint against the Home Office. Yeah. And they actually tend to look into them fairly properly and um, they will uphold a complaint if it's got good grounds often. I suppose that's the advantage of getting some experts in the room because it's your job to make sure everything is followed according to process, procedure. Um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So if, if it's not, if, um, if the Home Office aren't acting kind of within their guidance and rules, then there are sort of certain measures we can take to, to bring them into line. Oh, great. What kind of measures? So sometimes we have to get a bit threatening. We might threaten them um, with something called a judicial review okay, yeah. if they're not um, doing what they're meant to be doing. So if they're not mm. acting in accordance with the guidance or in accordance with the rules, yeah. then that itself could be a breach of the law. So we might threaten them with legal action and that threat might just give them the kind of nudge yeah. that we need to, to process the claim. Properly. And for us non-legal eagles, judicial review is... Sorry, yeah, a bit <laughs> jar jargonistic there, isn't it? So um, basically, if, a, if any public body is acting unlawfully, mm -hmm and there's no other sort of way of resolving this, yeah. then you can do a measure of last, res it's called a measure of last resort, is a judicial review, yeah. which is a, a, an action in the tribunal or the high court. Okay. But often just the threat of a judicial review is enough to, to get what you want. If I was looking to apply for asylum, what are the steps and what does that process look like for me? You'd have to register your asylum claim. Yeah. Now I should say that ideally you'd be wanting to get legal advice before you even claim asylum yeah. because during an asylum, they call it a screening interview, yeah. they will be asking fairly basic questions about how you got here yeah. and the basic questions about why you're claiming asylum. Yeah. But even at that early stage, everything's recorded, everything's taken down. So if you're saying something which you later maybe are not totally consistent about, that will be held against you. So you need to be careful 
even at that early stage of mm. registering your asylum claim. Yeah, so a screening interview sounds quite daunting. Would it I is, have you yeah. with me um, as someone like yourself? Yeah, uh, so, well, yeah. So it, it kind of depends what your funding is. So yeah. if it's legal aid, then unfortunately that initial screening interview itself is not covered. Yeah. The stage after that is to have your main asylum interview. And again, for that, the children, they are covered by legal aid. Yeah. Um, otherwise, generally, uh, legal aid doesn't cover attendance by a legal representative at that interview. Okay, yeah. However, what a good legal representative should be doing is preparing you really well before the interview. Good. Making so, you familiar with what questions might come up and mm. perhaps preparing a witness statement in advance of the interview as well. Yeah, so that's reassuring. So you're there with us every step of the way if we yes. wanted to go for yeah, it. that's right. Um, what happens next then? Okay, so you have your um, main interview. You may submit a witness statement as well. And then you may have evidence to submit to support your claim. Mm. So, um, you know, if you've come from a certain country where you're, uh, there might be documentary evidence to support your case, yeah. or there might be objective evidence, there might be um, country reports from academics that support your claim of yeah. persecution. So you get all this off to the Home Office and then you're really waiting for a decision. And unfortunately, particularly at the moment, that has taken a long time mm. to come through. And then you ultimately, you either get a positive or a negative decision. Yeah, I can imagine with that witness statement, it's probably a lot of back and forth between yourselves and the client just to yeah. agree that um, and it's a lot of reiterations until uh, me, the client, is happy with it. I can Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, they can be uh, really detailed and yeah. they, they should really have quite a bit of detail in them. So that can be the probably the biggest single part of your job as an asylum caseworker. Out of interest, what's the longest you've ever drafted? Oh, uh, we're definitely getting on to 30 plus pages. Ooh, so. so yeah, pretty significant. <laughs> yeah. Thank God we've got computers. <laughs> Absolutely. Not Oh, yes, wow. uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and what happens next then um, from that point of view? Okay, so everything's with the Home Office. They're then taking their time to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And either you're going to be granted refugee status mm -hmm. or if you're less fortunate, you, you'll have a refusal. And then the sort of standard next step would be to lodge an appeal mm -hmm. with the Immigration Tribunal against okay. that refusal. Great. And then does that then come to an end or is there more after that? Well, so you'd, you'd have your case put before an immigration judge. Yeah. And that's, for many people, that's their big sort of second chance to succeed with their case. They can normally introduce new evidence in the appeal um, and you'd normally have a specialist, either an immigration solicitor or a barrister, present the case in yeah. the tribunal. And then if your appeal the judge has to make a decision on your appeal mm -hmm. and if it's positive again you, you'll be granted refugee status if it's refused then you can normally appeal onwards to the higher tribunals and then and, and onwards what kind of percentage um are normally do you go on to the higher courts um? i mean yeah it's interesting i think currently there's most cases are being uh, are succeeding by the time you get to the first year tribunal yeah so i believe it's over half at the moment okay so um, that's really I mean, sure. you're Prospects do decrease, unfortunately, if you don't succeed at the first tribunal hearing. Yeah. There's a kind of like tapering off. It gets less likely the higher up you go. Yeah, and it, I suppose it's very costly to keep going. So eventually, it can be, yeah, yeah. If you're not covered by legal aid, it yeah, can be, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What are the steps if I wanted to bring um, a family member over or wanted to study in the UK? What would that look like? Um, okay, so yeah, if you want to bring over a family member, yeah then you'll have to check that the family member can meet the eligibility requirements for the visa that they're applying under. Yeah. So I generally recommend that you get legal advice at this early stage just for an initial assessment of, you know, can my partner, spouse, can they meet the requirements of that visa category? Yeah. Hopefully they can do. And then the next step is, well, there's, there's always a visa application itself that mm -hmm. you need to prepare. And then really important, there's documentary evidence to provide with that visa application. So normal evidence of finances, evidence of meeting an English language requirement, um, evidence about the relationship being genuine and mm. perhaps a marriage certificate. Get all that together. If you're getting a legal representation, you may get a cover letter written for you or you may want to do one yourself just to give a bit of narrative to um, background to your case. Yeah. How important is that cover letter to be really personable um, and in terms of that documenting, you know, English, what tends to trip people up most when mm. they're making these kind of applications? Sure. I mean, a cover letter is not actually a mandatory requirement. Yeah. It can just help explain stuff, particularly if something's not, if it's a bit unusual about your case and mm. you want to get that across to the caseworker at the Home Office. In terms of English, 
that is a bit of a minefield. So mm. there are approved English language tests at approved test centres. Yeah. So you've got to be careful that you're doing exactly the right one. Yeah. So you might do English at a higher level mm. at a non-approved test centre. Mm. And if you submit that with your visa application, it's probably going to get refused. So yeah. you'd have to be careful with the English language requirement. Yeah. And your advisor would explain all these approved test um, centres um, to you on the app. Yeah, app certainly. So. If you're getting legal advice, they should be telling you what's an approved English language test and, and what isn't. So in terms of if I was looking to apply for immigration to start work, um, how what would that process look like? Okay, so I would say that 95% of the sort of battle, so to speak, with um, if you're coming to work in the UK is getting sponsorship mm. from a UK organisation, so mm. normally a business. So they'll need a sponsor licence for that. Mm. So you need to check whether your prospective employer has a sponsor licence. Yeah. If they don't, unfortunately, it's a bit of a non-starter because they can't sponsor you. Mm. Um, but if they have a sponsor licence, they can sponsor you. And that's the big 95% of the uh, requirements are satisfied. But then on top of that, you've got this English language requirement. Mm -hmm. So it's level B1, it's a kind of intermediate level, <coughs> must be sitting a test from an approved test center. Yeah. Unless you're um, a majority, uh, you're a national of a majority English speaking country, yeah. or you've done a degree taught in English. Nice. Um, so they're the main ones, yeah. Um, when it comes to the sponsor license, do most employers, do they display that on their website when you're looking for a job? Not really, no. Oh, it's yeah. a, it can be, there is a register of sponsors. Oh, but great. I think there's about 30,000 uh, sponsor license holders. So it's oh, not great. obvious yeah. um, who's got a sponsor license, but you can always ask. Where I've can you one. find this register? So if you just Google um, register of sponsor license holders, you'll get this massive spreadsheet but you can actually search keyword search within that to check who's yeah. got a license so i suppose it's key people do their homework um from the very outset to Absolutely. check this or contact yeah. recruitment teams within the organization yeah, they might be able to, to validate that yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. thank you so much louis that's been really informative um i've personally learned so much um, as a child of an immigrant it's been really interesting just hearing the process um so thank you so much for your time and coming in and sharing this with us well thank you it's my pleasure thank you, thank you.